In 1963, the Royal Air Force sought a new supersonic advanced trainer aircraft to replace the Nat and the Hunter. This change aimed to reduce the costs of maintaining two outdated models and provide more realistic training for pilots transitioning to heavier and faster aircraft like the English Electric Lightning and TSR-2. To explore suitable designs, Air Staff Target 362 was created and sent to various existing aircraft manufacturers, including Hunting, Folland, English Electric, and the Hawker Siddeley Group. Air Staff Target 362 indicated that with additional weapons capability, the aircraft could also perform limited counterinsurgency roles, though its primary function was a high-performance trainer. The design required tandem seating, with some aircraft allowing the rear instructor position to be swapped for a navigator position for navigator training. Strict weight limits and impressive supersonic and low-level endurance were essential. However, the high costs of existing advanced projects, P-1154, TSR-2, and AW-681, and their overlapping service dates posed a financial challenge, leading to a potential delay in acquiring the new trainer. At the same time, the French Air Force also needed new aircraft. Their primary requirement was for an affordable strike aircraft. Additionally, they needed a new trainer to replace the outdated Magister. These two needs combined into the Tactical Combat Support Trainer Program. The requirements of the RAF and the French Air Force were converging at a time when both countries were struggling to afford continued military aircraft development. British industry responded with a variety of proposals, many featuring variable sweep designs. Although the new trainer didn't require this technology, the RAF supported it to provide companies with valuable expertise in the field. Initially, the RAF aimed to have the trainer operational by 1970 prompting companies to claim they could deliver in unrealistically short timeframes. By mid-1964, the RAF recognised that their best chance of acquiring the new trainer was through collaboration with the French. This cooperation was formalised with a Memorandum of Understanding to jointly develop an aircraft meeting both requirements. However, by mid-1965, Britain's financial difficulties led to the cancellation of the RAF's new strike and transport aircraft projects leaving the RAF with a new trainer project for aircraft that were no longer being developed. Meanwhile, the French had conducted a competition to select a domestic aircraft, choosing the Breguet BR-121. When the cooperation agreement was signed, Britain agreed to base the new design on the BR-121. The issue of variable sweep and the cancellation of the new strike jets was addressed by initiating another project, the Anglo-French Variable Geometry, to appease the BAC. Under the new trainer project, Breguet would design and build the nose, centre fuselage and undercarriage, while BAC would handle the intakes, rear fuselage, wings and tail. Both companies would maintain identical production lines, assembling components from each other to deliver aircraft to their respective air forces. The power plant's development was a joint effort between Rolls-Royce and Turbo Mecca, resulting in the Rolls-Royce RB172, named Adour. In May 1966, a joint Breguet BAC company called Sepacat, Société Européenne de Production de l'Avion d'École de Combat et d'Appui Tactique, was formed. After extensive discussions and securing permissions from Jaguar cars, the aircraft was named Jaguar. The French, having learned from the costly TSR-2 project, desired a jet that was lightweight, easy to maintain and rugged, rather than an all-encompassing, top-of-the-line aircraft. Their primary objectives for the new aircraft included training, tactical nuclear strikes in a European conflict where major air bases might be destroyed, and supporting French forces overseas in lower threat environments. Initially, the RAF planned to acquire 150 trainers. However, with the cancellation of the TSR-2 and P-1154 projects, the RAF reassessed their future light strike requirements and realised they needed more than just advanced trainers with secondary counterinsurgency capabilities. The RAF strike force was expected to include American F-111s and the AFVG for lighter strike missions. Concerns about the high-risk nature of both the F-111 and AFVG projects led the RAF to consider the Jaguar, especially since the French already planned a strike role for it, providing a viable backup plan for their future strike needs. In 1966, the RAF increased their order to 200 Jaguars, comprising 110 trainers, down from the initial 150, and 90 light strike tactical support versions. These versions would be far more sophisticated than the basic strike variant desired by the French. 
Subsequently, the French also increased their order to 200 aircraft, including an additional 40 carrier-based versions and 10 trainers for naval aviators. Five major variants were being developed. Jaguar Alpha, Jaguar Echo, Jaguar Bravo, Jaguar Sierra, and Jaguar Mike. Jaguar Alpha was the French single-seat strike aircraft, a basic version equipped with twin 30mm cannons, a twin gyro, a Doppler-based navigation attack system similar to the older Mirage 4, and Martel missile capability. Jaguar Echo was the French trainer version, which retained the cannons and hardpoints but lacked the navigation attack system and missiles. The RAF initially required the Jaguar Bravo trainer, but later added the Jaguar Sierra strike version. The French Navy wanted the Jaguar Mike, a single-seat carrier variant similar to the Jaguar Alpha, but with a stronger undercarriage and a laser rangefinder, which was also retrofitted to some Jaguar Alphas. The RAF's Jaguar Sierra was designed to be more advanced than the Jaguar Alpha, featuring a cutting-edge navigation attack system that was more accurate and complex, but less reliable a moving map display, a laser rangefinder, a marked target seeker in the nose, and a wider array of stores. The Jaguar Bravo trainer was almost as capable as the Sierra, lacking only the laser nose and one cannon, and excluding in-flight refueling equipment. The RAF's demand for supersonic performance required significant redesigns, as the BR-121 was initially subsonic. New wings, a reshaped fuselage, a higher rear cockpit, and engines with reheats were being developed. BAC was also extensively reworking the internal layout, so despite the general resemblance, the BR-121 design was soon outdated. The French were not entirely pleased with the extensive work required for the supersonic requirement, but publicly, both partners maintained a unified and positive front. Development faced significant challenges, particularly with engine problems that slowed the project. Similar to the TSR-2 design, Integrating a new engine with a new airframe caused issues, and this time, there was no flying testbed available to assist. Additionally, Breguet's merger talks with Dassault in 1967, which eventually went through, negatively impacted the program's export prospects. The first prototype, Echo 01, was rolled out in April 1968 and, after ground trials, was transported to Istre, where it made its first flight. Engine issues plagued the early test flights, with a single-seat prototype, Alpha 03, suffering from poor engine performance and landing short of the runway in May 1969, causing damage. Echo 01 was lost in March 1970 due to an engine fire. The pilot shut down the faulty engine, but also mistakenly shut down the good engine on final approach, failing to select manual emergency power and losing hydraulic control, forcing him to eject. The damage to Alpha 03 and the loss of Echo 01 significantly slowed the development program, and Alpha 03 was later written off after another engine fire in 1972. The first British single-seat prototype flew in 1969, achieving supersonic speed on its first flight, but was destroyed on the ground in August 1972 due to an uncontained engine failure. The first British two-seater flew on August 30th, 1971, and thankfully, it survived to retirement. Test flights revealed the need for numerous changes. Production airframes added both ventral fins and an enlarged tail fin to improve stability, which was a significant issue at the time, necessitating the addition of a lateral auto-stabilizer system. Other noticeable changes include perforating the air brakes and removing the intake splitter plates. Structural rigidity issues in the fuselage caused the spine area to bend slightly under load, leading to uncommanded rudder inputs and roll-yaw coupling, which could result in unexpected rolls during dive recovery, especially when stores were loaded under the wings. A compensating system was installed as part of a roll auto-stabilizer to address this. The first production Jaguar Alpha rolled off the assembly lines in May 1972, seven years after the project began, and the first Jaguars entered service with the French Air Force in June 1973, with initial squadrons primarily assigned to the nuclear strike role. This capability was demonstrated in July 1974, when a Jaguar Alpha dropped an 8 kiloton AN-52 tactical nuclear bomb on the Mururoa Atoll. In 1970, the RAF decided to abandon using the Jaguar as a trainer for anything other than training Jaguar pilots. They revised their order to include 165 Jaguar Sierra aircraft and only 35 trainers. Shortly after, they authorised Hawker Siddeley to proceed with the HS-1182 project, 
later named Hawk, to meet their trainer requirements. Similarly, the French initiated the Franco-German Alpha Jet program for their training needs. On the French side, the Jaguar Mike, the carrier version, underwent trials starting in 1969. However, the Aeronaval was not satisfied with the engine's response time during go-arounds from failed arrested landings, single engine safety, or roll response at low speeds with flaps down. An entirely new wing was designed and built for the Jaguar Mike to address these issues. But the second round of carrier trials was cut short when engine compressor casings were found to be cracking under deck landing loads. Dassault then proposed an upgrade of their existing Etondar, the Super Etondar, arguing it would be cheaper and safer. Despite the single-engine safety margin being non-existent, the Super Etondard was perceived as a less risky option compared to the Jaguar Mike. Consequently, the French cancelled the Jaguar Mike program, which never received the new wing, and ordered the Super Etondards instead. These ended up costing more than expected, leading to reduced numbers. The cancellation of the Jaguar Mike also led to a decline in Brazilian and Argentinian interest in the Jaguar. While the decision to abandon the Jaguar Mike ultimately proved wise, Dassault faced accusations at the time of favouring their own designs to secure 100% of the sales income, rather than sharing profits with the British through the half-British Jaguar. This competitive stance was evident in other export attempts for the Jaguar. The export version, Jaguar International, was based on the more advanced RAF Jaguar Sierra, GR1, with BAC handling much of the additional development work. Dassault, however, often undermined their partner by offering better deals on the Mirage 5 or F1. Consequently, while sales were made to Oman, Ecuador and Nigeria, they were relatively modest. Egypt and Libya showed interest, but political concerns over regional stability led to the British government discouraging these sales. The significant success came with India, which ordered 160 Jaguars, primarily to be built locally by HAL. In September 1974, the Jaguar OCU was redesignated as 226 OCU, inheriting the number from the former Lightning OCU disbanded at Coltis Hall in June. Subsequently, 54 and 6 squadrons formed with the new aircraft, and RAF Germany restructured, assigning 6 squadrons to the Jaguar, replacing Phantoms and Harriers. Initially, the RAF's Jaguars were underpowered and plagued by an unreliable navigation and weapon aiming system. The aircraft could be challenging to fly, prone to sudden and unforgiving departures from controlled flight at the edges of its performance envelope. With its small swept wing, carrying heavy loads on operational missions further reduced its performance margins. An audio warning system was installed to alert pilots at critical angles of attack related to the stall's configuration, which pilots ignored at their peril, leading to frequent training losses. In April 1975, the Jaguar gained significant attention when BAC demonstrated its capability to use a motorway as a runway. A GR-1 landed on the nearly completed M55, was armed with four bombs and took off again. Despite its rough field capability, the Jaguar rarely needed to use it in service, as the Soviets never targeted RAF runways during the Cold War. The development and deployment of the Jaguar aircraft were marked by numerous challenges as strategic decisions. Initially intended as a supersonic advanced trainer to replace outdated models, the collaboration between the RAF and the French Air Force evolved into a complex project that faced financial, technical and political hurdles. Despite engine problems and the eventual abandonment of the Jaguar Mike variant, the Jaguar proved its versatility and capability, particularly with the RAF's advanced Jaguar Sierra model. The aircraft's deployment spanned multiple roles, from training to tactical nuclear strikes, highlighting its adaptability. The Jaguar's significant export success with India and its operational presence in various RAF squadrons underscored its impact. Notably, its demonstrated rough field capability, though rarely utilised in service, showcased its innovative design. Overall, the Jaguar program exemplified the difficulties and triumphs of international military aircraft development. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe for more, and ring that notification bell to stay updated on our latest posts. Thank you for your support.